I'm one of the program leads at Northeast Ohio Medical University's ECHO program. Um, we have today we're gonna have a short didactic by David Sharp. We have some panelists. Um, they will be able to answer questions and provide some feedback. And we also then have a case from uh, one of our partners at Coleman Professional Services. And in that case, I think we're going to get kind of an update on what she's seeing out in practice. So during today's session, if you have questions, please use the chat box. We're going to do a blend of reading from the chat box and asking people to unmute themselves. But it's questions, comments, feedback, please use that in the chat box throughout today's session um, as a place to start. And I don't know if we have all of our panelists on yet, so I'm going to do the didactic first. So I'm going to hand it over to David Sharp. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome. Good to see some of you again. I will just share my screen now. Hold on one second. Oh, father. There we go. Okay, so, oh, technical difficulties, please stand by one more second. Okay, sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so today we're talking about loneliness in general um, and the kind of uh, importance of understanding and acknowledging what loneliness can look like and what loneliness can do to both the human body and the human mind. Uh, so just kind of as a quick uh, descriptor or definition, um, loneliness is not the same as being alone. So loneliness is an aversive state that actually signals something very important to your survival. It is telling you that something is wrong. It can be both physical loneliness uh, where you do not have um, friends or family around you, it also can be a, a more existential loneliness. So when I wrote these slides, I was here in my office for maybe 10 hours looking at, at all of the different things and nobody was around me. But that's not the same as being a, a lonely or alone or isolated because everybody that I'm talking to today, um, you were all in my mind. So this solitary act was very social. Um, I had to imagine or predict what you as medical professionals uh, wanted to know, what would help you, what would help your patients. Um, I had to use myself to imagine how the 20 minutes that I'm going to be talking um, could save your life or the life of your patients, people that I have never talked with and probably will never meet. And so by doing all of this, it actually felt me felt very intimate to me um, and intimate with my own uh, humanity. Um, so as a social species, we uh, find isolation to be physically and emotionally deleterious. But that is a kind of an evolutionary adaptation because the same uh, evolutionary pathway that allowed us to feel loneliness also gave us generosity, kindness, and empathy. So loneliness itself um, is a sadness that uh, we have no friends or no company. But in trying to figure out a nice, uh, a nice explanation of loneliness, I had to kind of think about what the opposite of loneliness meant. Um, and things that are similar to us would be thirst or pain. And what is the difference or what is the opposite of thirsty? Uh, what is the opposite of being in pain? Uh, what is the opposite of lonely? And the, the answer is kind of normal. Um, when you have something to drink, you don't feel anti-thirsty. You just feel like everything is, is correct. You're not in a constant state of I don't feel pain, you're just in a constant state of everything's fine. Loneliness uh, kind of ties into those. Um, the, the feeling of loneliness ends up being uh, this connected social process. So the, the, the feelings of loneliness end up 
really being a sense of loss, loss of community instead of loss of uh, physical things. Um, so I, I did a lot of the, the background research for this talk on uh, a couple of professors, doctors, uh, Holly and uh, Cacioppo, but also it comes from this ecological dominant social competition model. Effectively, and I will try and go through this as quickly as possible, um, we started using social interactions for everything. And as our social interactions became more complex, our ability to navigate complex social uh, interactions made our brain more developed. And it was this positive feedback loop of social interactions create a more social brain that has um, kind of promoted the brain and this socializing to be so important to us that not having it is emotionally damaging. So we will look through uh, a quick example. So 200,000 years ago, we've got the lion, uh, Pantera Leo, and David, the Homo sapien. And we were both on the savanna together. This was our life. Now, I'm a little bigger than most of the savanna dwellers. Uh, at six foot four, I'm about six or eight inches taller than I should have been 200,000 years ago. But the, uh, the comparison is not great for me. They have better vision. They're bigger. They're faster. They're heavier. Uh, they have claws. They have teeth. They can be louder than us. Um, we have no real defense physically from them. So we had to develop this brain. The brain is uh, an amazing thing. Our brain works against environmental, uh, against species, and within species. Quick examples of how other species have done this. The peppered moth. During the Industrial Revolution, the peppered moth uh, comes in two varieties. You've got the, the white one with the black speckles and the black one. During the Industrial Revolution in England, the soot from all the factories turned the trees black and the white speckled moths stood out uh, to birds and they diminished in uh, population. But once we got into a, uh, a more clean environment, the trees went back to having lichen on them and all of a sudden your moths just disappeared. The black ones, the darker ones became more prevalent. They became consumed. So you compete against the environment. You also compete against predators or other species. If the wolf gets faster, it eats the slower rabbits and the next generation of rabbits are faster. If the wolf gets quieter, then the, the rabbits with poorer hearing get eaten and rabbits become more sensitive. Uh, now, when I was practicing this, I actually called this a flamingo. So obviously I am not a bird person, but um, pelicans, no, uh, peacocks, peacocks. So a peacock's tail shows how fit it is because the male peacock has to carry this huge tail behind it. And the larger the tail is, the stronger the bird had to be in order to carry that tail around. Um, so you can see just how healthy the peacock is by how large that tail feather, those tail feathers are. And finally, dominance displays. Uh, the larger uh, antlers, the stronger the moose. So when you look at humans, what are our environmental, our dominance, our, cost, our, our honest signaling displays? And it ends up being the brain. Now there are other ones, but the brain transcends all of our different com uh, competition styles. So instead of having uh, uh, fur or thick skin, we developed clothing and houses. We developed agriculture. We don't have to go, uh, we don't have to, to compete against the environment. We control the environment. So the brain, instead of developing claws, we developed spears, we developed nets, fishing uh, within species. Uh, the honesty displays could be how much wealth you have. Being able to purchase a very fancy car says, I have so much money, I can waste it on this $100,000 car. Imagine what I can do for you. And then the dominance displays um, a suit that is well tailored and broad with shoulder pads makes you look bigger and stronger. Being able to negotiate um, uh, uh, 
units or groups having your your people having your back can make you look stronger but you need to be able to navigate through society in order to have all of these things now the result 200,000 years later is that the lion is exactly the same but everything that the lion had against me that that he could use i have found ways to compensate through non-internal factors. I have a car, so I don't have to run. I have a gun, so I don't need claws. Honestly, it's really easy to hunt at a grocery store. Nothing moves, nothing gets away. Um, And by doing this, it kind of makes sense because in order to survive in our incredibly social environment, we had to learn Uh, We had to learn our society through observation of society. We had to recognize the shifting statuses of friends and foes. We had to anticipate and coordinate efforts between two or more people. We have to use language, not just to communicate, but also to reason, to teach, and to deceive. We have to navigate social hierarchies. We have to recruit others in order to sanction those that violate group norms. And we have to do all of this across a huge time frame we remember so we have to navigate who has slighted us in the past and then we have to predict multiple different futures to to possible futures in order to ensure that we are promoting not just our own self uh continuation but the continuation of the species now uh, as i have said uh because loneliness is this isolation from from your society it does hit you the same way that physical pain does but instead of pulling our hand away from the fire this pain actually promotes social connections the ones that are necessary to maintain our collective success and what uh, we have found in in research uh this is a cacioppo's work is that lonely people and non-lonely people, they experience the same day. They have the same amount of social interactions, the same positives, the same negatives. The difference is when you ask them how their day was, and and Cacioppo did an experiment where he pinged lonely and non-lonely people about 66 times, asked them what they were doing and how they felt, and and they discovered that you had the same experiences, but what happened is that somebody who's lonely rated the positive things as less positive and the negative things as more negative. So they were internalizing their own distress and um, projecting it out as life is just not good. <clears throat> so um, with this kind of feeling, with the feelings of loneliness, uh, what is truly bad about being lonely is that um, especially in males, we underreport our loneliness because loneliness has become the equivalent of weakness in men. We are supposed to buck up and get over it, but we, we, you, you don't. It's like telling somebody who hasn't eaten in a couple of days that it's fine, just get over it, um, and it's not the same. So um, we feel that. Um, if hunger was as stigmatized as loneliness, then people would not get help. People would not uh, uh, try and recover from anorexia. Um, but we we allow, not allow, we, we accept that hunger and fire are uh, issues that can be resolved, whereas loneliness, it's just not, it's not felt that way. So... Um, <clears throat> We, sorry, we, McPherson did a a fabulous study in uh, about 2006 looking at how often people had uh, confidants that they could tell anything to. So that's the the third one there is um, in 1984, about 40 years ago, on average, people listed three people that they could tell all of their secrets to. By 2005, on average, people couldn't list a single person. Now, that doesn't mean that you couldn't list a single person. That means that on average, people were saying, I don't have anybody that I can talk to about all of my feelings. 
So if you are lonely, that's the person that you would talk to. And 15 years ago, we had acknowledged that we have lost that kind of close connection. Now add a pandemic to it and uh, you now have a situation where loneliness is just um, un, not uncurable, but, but difficult to, uh, to resolve. Now getting into the, the physiological and the, and the emotional um, elements of loneliness and how it impacts you, uh, it puts you in this state of hypervigilance. Um, I, I'm sure you've all done this. You walk down a path, you see something that looks like a snake, and you jump back. Uh, my wife, who I love to, to bring for examples, even though I live here and we've been married for 10 years, if I turn the corner and she's not expecting me, she screams. And she's in this state. And, and my only response is, hi, it's me. I'm your husband. Uh, we've done this before. Nice to meet you. Uh, but this, this loneliness, because you are um, in a state of hypervigilant, vigilance, you believe that you don't have protection. And you have to think back to this ecological model that we talked about in that um, there's a time, about eight hours a night, where you are completely helpless. You are asleep. Um, imagine if you were in a cave and you were alone and there were lions. Being unconscious for eight hours is a very dangerous thing. So your body wakes up more easily. Your, your little hyper uh, awake moments during sleep are higher on your first night at a hotel because it simulates that feeling of, I don't know that I'm secure. So being lonely puts you in this state all the time. You are, your sleep goes down. You, have, you just don't have the ability to relax and feel like you are part of a group, that you are around a campfire of people that are going to take care of you. And it's a very isolating feeling. Um, in addition to that, because you no longer um, are at your mental uh, sharp, your sharpness, um, you are going to be less capable of empathizing with other people. That will make you feel more hostile because you can't take their perspective anymore. And so we have seen that as you become lonely, uh, your ability to be social or have good social skills goes down. It reduces. The long-term consequences of that, and I have a, a page of citations at the end if you'd like to do some more reading on it, are that um, you have increased risk of a plethora of issues, of uh, suicide, cognitive performance for, for health practitioners, for you who are going to be doctors and nurses, um, you really do have to be at your best. You have to trust your team members to support you and to predict what you are going to be doing and what you are going to be needing. And imagine if you lose that cap capacity, that capability, you are performing less capably and you don't trust your team to uh, work at their best either. And so you're going to see um, a reduction in overall work quality as mental health issues continue to impact you. From a physical standpoint, we've actually seen that people stop working out. Um, and while you are lonely, you are going to also be less capable of re-motivating yourself to work out, uh, to start working out again. You also will see an increase in caloric intake, mostly fats and sugars, because you are trying to feed your emotions. You're looking for comfort food. I actually overheard uh, somebody uh, at the beginning of this lecture talk about an Amazon purchase. We are seeing that people are purchasing Amazon products because the thrill of having somebody come to your house, even if it is just to drop off a package, gives you a social interaction. So, we, I mean, we are looking for ways to find uh, some kind of contact with the outside world. But when you look at the physical health, you are seeing uh, these increases of, uh, of physiological aging. Um, I, a study came out, I don't know if it's, if it's um, how accurate it is, but they're reporting that uh, COVID isolation loneliness could be taking 10 years off of the life of, of the estimated lifespan of people who are catching COVID. Um, so it's, it's truly a, an issue. And so what what kind of the, the takeaway of, of all of these potential 
harms emotionally and physically is that at the moment we all as social uh, uh, humans, we are no longer at these campfires. We are no longer sitting around a communal source of warmth, engaging with each other in meaningful ways. And in order to kind of push past that and, and not, and not the whole like buck up guy, not the nuclear cowboy mentality. It's that we have to understand that um, our, our, our way to combat loneliness is to start with ourselves and we cannot help our patients and we cannot help our team if we are not practicing self care. Um, so if you are lonely, probably those around you are lonely as well. It, it, there needs to be a, a vigilance because when you see a person is dehydrated, you give them water. If you see a person is anorexic, you help them learn to eat. If you see a person is bleeding, you take them to trauma, but how do you see when somebody is lonely? And how do you see when someone is lonely when you are also lonely? And we need to build these new fires and make relationships matter so that we can start uh, turning our, our loneliness into new best practices for uh, our, our current environment. And so one of the things that we will uh, uh, talk about in two weeks is that um, one of the things that could come from this is post-traumatic growth. We have found that you need sometimes something negative to happen in order to reset the system and reassess uh, the pre-trauma social, economic, and cultural norms so that we can reject the ones that no longer resonate with the community and adopt the ones that saw us through this trauma. And so my examples here are heart attacks and divorce. The best way to get somebody to start a healthy diet is for them to have a heart attack. And that's a horrible thing. Don't ask your patients to do that. But we find that um, <clears throat> a significant event causes people to reevaluate. And so hopefully we can use the, the loneliness and the trauma of COVID to find a way to, like I say, build new campfires and get people sitting around the table or the, or the fire in a healthy way. And so that's, I'll, I'll leave it at, hopefully that will be a good avenue for questions, but thank you very much. I do have slides of references if you'd like to read. Thank you very much, David. Um, so if you could stop your screen share, I wanna answer a couple of questions that have come through the chat box for some housekeeping items and then introduce our panelists um, who will be able to kind of really speak to uh, questions that come through and you know, I'd like to hear their own reflections on uh, your presentations as well. Regarding the slides, uh, the whole premise of Project ECHO is that all teach and all learn and we wanna be, be monopolized knowledge. So we will be emailing the slides to you after today's session and recordings will be posted to the Neomed Project Echo website. Um, but yes, you can share the slides how you wish to. Um, please, for those of you who would like to collect continuing education for today's session, go to eat.com and enter today's code, which is 73ZONK, Z-O-N-K. And our uh, amazing coordinators will be able to help you figure out EADS if you need some specific instruction on that, so just please chat to them in the chat box. So at this point, again, David, that was a fantastic presentation. I look forward to hearing people's questions and uh, various thoughts. But to introduce our panel real quick, um, we'll start with Jennifer Dougal. Hello, I'm Jennifer Dougal. I am the director for the Center for Student Wellness and Counseling Services at Northeast Ohio. Medical University. Thanks. Sarah Dugan? Hello, I'm Sarah Dugan. I'm a mental health pharmacist and an associate professor in the Department of Pharmacy Practice at Northeast Ohio Medical University. Thank you. Russell Spee? Hi, y'all. My name is Russell. I'm a psychologist. I work in the Department of Psychiatry at Neomed. 
and I do a opioid use disorder echo on Friday. Thanks. Doug Smith? Good afternoon. Uh, Douglas Smith, psychiatrist at Neomed and at the Summit County Alcohol, Drug Addiction, Mental Health Services Board. And Joe Zarconi. I saw you for a second, Dr. Zarconi. Sorry, I thought I hit that. Uh, Joe Zarconi, uh, Professor and Chair of Internal Medicine and Senior Associate Dean of Health Affairs at Neomed. Excellent, thank you very much. Troy, do any of you have any specific reflections on uh, the presentation before I go into the questions from the chat box? Just make one comment from uh clinical colleagues that are talking about this whole issue because it, it kind of connects to this concept. Uh, and we've had some, we've touched on this, social media, Zoom meetings as a substitute for social connection, et cetera. And what some of the clinicians are saying is interesting, there's two things. One is initially they like it better because they're seeing inside the person's home. So they're actually getting a better, as a clinician, you're a trained observer, better sense of the person with their home. Um, which is why I quickly switched to my uh, sunset in the Galapagos Islands background. Uh, and then uh, you, uh, on the other hand, you, it's not the same thing trying to evaluate a patient across the internet, across Zoom, without, especially for us in the mental health and addiction arena. You, you know, having the person in the room, there is something there uh, that is not duplicable through a phone call or video audio meeting. You, you need to be able to in that room to, to feel the person. That's that humanness uh, that uh, uh, he was speaking about. And I think there's, there's something in there that uh, unfortunately, you know, that's why we're having this COVID loneliness potentially is that, you know, people are not really socially connected as much as they thought they were. And, and I thought it was an interesting comment when he said that now people on average say they have nobody that they would confide in in terms of today's world, not just COVID. And I think that's interesting because of course, so many people now boast how many hundreds or thousands of friends they have on Facebook or all these other things. And you question the use of the word friend <laughs> in terms of this idea of loneliness. And so I'm, I'm thinking that perhaps one of the things that will happen from this uh, home, work from home or self-isolation is we'll probably be able to get a better sense of who our actual friends are. Uh, who are the actual people that we confide in, that we interact with, our neighborhoods, perhaps. I know Dr. Zarconi's talked about having neighborhood uh, social distancing gatherings and so forth. I mean, it gives you a sense of what's really going on with the social connection that I don't think we are always so aware of when we're going through our daily lives and we already have them around us, whether they're in our home or at our work or at the gym or wherever the people that we've befriended. So anyway, I thought it was a great talk and it got me thinking a lot of directions, so. And Nicole, I wanted to just say, uh, I love the talk also, and I just wanna make the observation of how much richer a presentation like this is with metaphor. Uh, so David, thank you for, uh, for all of the metaphor throughout the, the presentation. And my favorite of those is the metaphor of the campfire. So thank you for that. Agree. With I really appreciated it too. The things that were come that I was thinking about were sort of wondering the intersection of culture and loneliness in this pandemic. So, you know, it made me kind of wonder for, for providers and, and patients alike, some of us are more of a collectivist orientation. Some of us have a more individualistic orientation. Some of us are more inclined to touch. Some of us are less inclined to touch. And I'm just kind of wondering, and there probably aren't answers to that yet, that sort of how those intersecting cultural values, uh, how, how it's intersecting with COVID-19 and social distancing. Sorry, I was muted. I can kind of answer that because research has been done on loneliness comparing the more Western um, <clears throat> single family units versus the more collective, uh, more Asian communities. And they have found that actually the collectivist populations are more sensitive to loneliness and get lonely more often because there is this kind of ass uh, assumption that we are all in this together. 
So when you get pulled out of that campfire, it hits you harder. Mm-hmm. Where we are more nuclear and, and individual independence, we're kind of used to this being uh, an assault on our emotions. And so we've built up a, a slightly higher tolerance for it. Interesting. Thank you. So Jody Bell, you had your hand raised. Uh, can you unmute yourself and share your question or comment? Uh, yes. I, hi, everybody. I love the part where it was about, he said, build new fires. Sometimes it takes a negative situation to reset the growth of post-traumatic growth. And it's just so interesting is that, you know, as a peer supporter, um, I've had that experience, but it was the exact opposite. For me, as far as the loneliness has gone, um, goes, it has been the exact opposite. I have filled this new sense of freedom is because I feel that because of being a person who has such a high uh, reactivity uh, to external environments that um, with a low tolerance to it all, that because of the social distancing and the isolation, not having to fight so hard to combat all of that sometimes overactive stimuli that happens in the environment that we don't have any control over. It has been so emotionally and mentally and psychologically peaceful and that it has been a whole sense of freedom And so I'm one of the ones who have embraced this moment of of calm and peace in the environment. Thank you very much, Jerry. That is awesome. Um, Nicole, I I would pose a a question to uh, David or other uh, panelists. Uh, Some of what you talked about David uh, put me in mind of the writing of Viktor Frankl, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And uh, Frankl, in his uh, landmark book called um, Man's Search for Meaning, um, writes that we derive a sense of meaning in our lives in three major spheres, right? And And the first of those is relationship. And the second of those is work. Um, and in, in this sort of pandemic experience, we are being deprived of at least two of those two spheres uh, from which we derive a lot of personal uh, meaning or a sense of meaning. Uh, and, and I could imagine that the lack of having the, uh, a sense of meaning uh, provided uh, for us now on a daily basis, which we used to have provided in the relationships and in the workplace, uh, might fuel this uh, sense of loneliness. I wonder what you think about that. I don't disagree with you. Um, the I think the what what <clears throat> maybe fueling the sense of loneliness isn't that uh, that it's not that we're working from home. It's that we're at our home during a crisis trying to work, and so I know I'm probably not getting as much engagement or or um sense of of success from it um so i think i think i mean victor franco does a good job of highlighting where we can find happiness and trying to get as much happiness from as you say one third of our reasons for being uh, complicates it. I don't know if that if that goes into what Jody was saying with how she's enjoying the break. That might just be an introvert extrovert thing, where the extroverts who focused more on others are getting hit very hard, whereas the introverts who uh, were okay having fewer more intimate relationships are absolutely thriving. But um, if anybody else wants to take a hit at that, it's a great question. I'm I'm thinking um, just kind of chiming in here as we we talk about this that um, that it's really a matter of what what our values are and what we hold important to us that where we can find those meanings from and I think sometimes those values can change 
based on our circumstances. Um, so, you know, I think um, I appreciate Jody's response and kind of identifying that in, in many ways it, there can be chaos and now I'm finding my peace. And, and for someone else, it could be, you know, a, a different perspective. And so I think it goes back to what David was saying earlier about this sense of research that, that's talking about, like, it's what our perspective is and, and how, you know, is a glass glass half full, I don't want to, you know, minimize it to this, but is a glass half full or empty? Um, and, you know, are, and if it's, if it's, if I find that it's empty, um, what are the things that are most important to me to help change that process? Thank you. I want to get to a couple of the questions from the chat box. Um, so one question is, how would you see loneliness as being connected to vicarious trauma? And I will, I'll try that. I'm, I am not a clinical psychiatrist. So if one of you guys wants to jump in, you just speak over me. I was, yeah, I was going to ask Russell because I said you were about to unmute and I know Russell's done a lot of talk on vicarious trauma, but either one of you or both. Yeah, and this is just sort of like, um, I don't know that I have research to refer to, right? So this is just kind of my anecdotal experience um, of being, being a clinician and, and stressful, traumatic, working, doing a lot of trauma work for years. I think that um, one of the ways that, again, this is kind of values like what Jennifer Dougal said, um, and kind of what we adopted as our coping strategies. But there, I think there are many people who find community of other providers healing in terms of mitigating the impact of vicarious trauma. It's not uncommon for work groups when a traumatic event has happened that there are these sort of built-in mechanisms where people process that as a group. And the processing is not only to learn, okay, what do we learn from that experience and how could we maybe mitigate the risk, but there's also this catharsis and, and compassion and, and just telling the story, the narrative, um, which we also believe in trauma work, the telling the narrative and beginning to get um, some kind of uh, acceptance of that narrative um, is part of what helps many of us heal. So I think when people are seeing traumatic events happening and they don't have the normal ways of processing that with their community, I would believe that it could then exacerbate that experience of vicarious trauma. That's sort of just my opinion on it and others may have other opinions or ideas about that. I had a, this is again, it's anecdotal. I had a best friend whose PhD was on uh, courtroom uh, reliability of children who have suffered through sexual trauma. And um, as the long-term boyfriend of her, uh, their entire cohort plus us were basically taught to escape, rest, and play. And, and they formed a very close-knit group of people who had all read the same uh, uh, interviews and, and seen the same horrible things. And they found solace in each other because only they really understood uh, what they were going through. And so they would, they would have outings, go apple picking, go lay on the grass and stare at the clouds specifically to find friendships in things that had nothing to do with what was giving them the vicarious trauma. Great, thank you very much. Um, another question is uh, from Stephen. I'm wondering about situational versus clinical loneliness and chemical changes in the brain. Um, from what I have read, I don't, I don't know if they, if they divide those two together, but you do see increases in cortisol in the brain and the cortisol is going to effectively lead to that hypervigilance, lack of sleep because cortisol isn't just a stress hormone. It also regulates your uh, circadian rhythm. It also is used to process carbohydrates. So people who are, uh, uh, lonely are going to see sleep loss as well as uh, agitation as well as as uh, constant vigilance 
I'm, I know there are more than that though, but that's the one that comes to mind. There's another aspect um, kind of looking at this and um, I don't know if David could speak more to this, but I came across a, um, a, a TED talk um, by, uh, I have her book right here, Kelly McGonigal. Um, she wrote a book called The Upside of Stress. And, and I think this ties into some of the research um, that David was, was, was talking about, um, or with, at least within that, that area, to identify that there are times where you know, stress is, is, is good for us. Um, you know, being surprised or joyful by something delightful or, or um, going on in life, you know, that, that would be you stress, um, the, the good kind of stress. Um, and then we have stress where it's that long withstanding, um, long term type of um, feeling that can lead to burnout, just complete inundation um, of kind of stress. And the thought was, is that, um, and it, this ties in again with what he was saying, is that they found that people who framed it differently were coping with it in very different ways. And in fact, um, community with others and kind of like debriefing or finding community of just maybe no solution is found, but just finding the way, the cathartic um, nature of just sharing an experience could actually strengthen um, one's brain um, and body and improve that. Um, and there's some research that is out there, in, you know, at least she's saying it is out there in that regard. So I recently purchased the book because I was interested to hear um, more about this. But um, I, but I, you know, just speaking anecdotally about myself, um, you know, and the changes that our family has made and going and adjustments for work and a home, work at the office and what have you, um, I have noticed um, a big difference in how we, we have adjusted. And we have a group we meet with um, once a week, just even with Zoom, and just sharing an update on how each family is doing has been very um, nurturing and healing um, to our family. And we're, we're kind of uh, introverted folk, <laughs> the Dougals are. So <laughs> um, to, to know that that's been helping is, is very different. So it's reframing it, I think, and finding a place that someone at least sharing is feeling listened to and heard um, can actually bring about that healing aspect. So that is a big thing to kind of to tease apart, but yes, uh, you stress is the same concept as stress. Kind of the difference is you stress comes with usually positivity or happiness or some kind of uh, mediating emotion. And whereas the stress is <clears throat> typically uh, something you would perceive as outside your own normal coping mechanisms. So having stress with happiness or with uh, um, stress in a way that you can manage, like playing chess. Playing chess will stress you out, um, but it stresses you out in a, in a competitive fun way, whereas this loneliness is something that you may not feel like you can handle. So I know that there's a lot to, there's a lot more to it, but yes, um, absolutely. Uh, I, I, I did a, a small study a decade ago where we stressed out older adults. Um, I accused them of shoplifting in a laboratory environment. It was a lot of fun. Um, and then we gave them either a positive video to watch or a negative video to watch. And over 60 minutes, the individuals given the positive uh, video to watch, their their blood pressure, heart rate went back down to normal very quickly, and their cortisol went back down to normal very quickly. But if I stressed them out and didn't rectify the situation, their cortisol and their blood pressure stayed up for an hour and a half or two hours. So uh, that's one of the, I think, the major difference between having a eustress versus a distress. So since we do have a case today, I'm going to do one or two more questions and then go to the case. And I apologize to anyone who I, we don't get to your question. Um, we're trying to do that the best that we can. And we might still have time for questions to come back to some of them after the case. Um, but let's do, there's a question for the panel on what are your thoughts around loneliness related to the wearing of face masks and PPE? Yeah, I, 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 
I was hoping you get to this question. I really liked when it popped up. So thank you for the person that posed the question. I think this is really an important question. Um, and a lot was written about this issue in the early days of the HIV epidemic, but in particular from the perspective of uh, the patients uh, who received visitors in their room, medical visitors in their room that were dressed in you know, these uh, spacesuits and, and had this very, uh, very alien uh, feel. In fact, often were described as aliens uh, coming into their rooms. So, and it's, it's interesting because uh, in, there's, there's also been a lot written about the extent to which medicine turns to military or wartime metaphors or language. Uh, we talk about people losing their battle with cancer, for example, and this virus has been described as an enemy and as an invader and as, you know, this thing that's out to get us. And to the extent that we uh, now wear masks around each other, we do, I think, subtly and maybe subconsciously, maybe in some respects consciously communicate uh, that I'm wearing this mask because you that I'm seeing in front of me uh, is, uh, you are the enemy or you, uh, you might present the enemy to me, right? So it, it sort of creates this subconscious um, adversarial environment where we're all each other's adversaries. We all are threats to each other. And, uh, and, and I think uh, we don't do a very good job in medicine of acknowledging that tension when we see patients. And so we're often talking to students and residents about make sure that if you're gowned in glove that you go in and you say, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to, you know, you know I'm not seeing you as unclean or evil or any of this. This is just, you know, the policy or whatever. But I think that this mask wearing creates this environment where we're all bumping into each other as a bunch of uh, adversaries and, and, uh, and people who pose nothing to us but risk, which mitigates the extent to which the people around us can offer us companionship or you know, love or other things. So I, I, uh, I think that's something we all ought to be conscious of as we run around wearing our face coverings. I, so I I would I would speak to that, Joe, because I, I would talk about that it's all a matter of perspective. Because you could also look at a mask and the use of a mask as a way in which I am protecting others from what I could possibly hurt them in another way. So I'm giving love to someone else by protecting them. You know, and it's I, I know that it ends up getting political these days re regarding that, but but it does it does open up a different perspective. Then it makes me feel like, um, you know, and I think that I think what you're saying is you need to have that dialogue and and really communicate that effectively with the patients so that they understand um, what that that is for. But we could look at it the other way and just say I'm doing this because I care for you. Um, you know, in that way. Yeah, I think it's really variable, right? But the, the, so it's variable. So people are gonna to respond to it differently. And probably the way in which we discuss or present with our face mask is gonna also affect that interaction. The one line of research I think is interesting that kind of speaks to this through the back door is that there's studies where you, um, people with, tro with um, diagnosed with PTSD and also people who are diagnosed with um, depression if you show them a picture of someone with sort of a flat looking affect, um, they, were, they are more likely in general to perceive that face is hostile or is, um, is in some way um, aggressive. And so I think that for some populations, the mask could then just lead to more sort of interpretation of what's the person's motives behind the mask. Um, but again, I think it's very variable, right? There's a lot of variability in terms of how people are going to respond to it. Um, so I think how we discuss it as clinicians and even wonder how our patients think about it uh, may be a good idea, right? Just to have the discussion about it. And maybe to just, I don't have an answer for this, but to, but to flip the question in a completely different way and probably can't talk too long about it, but uh, do women who wear hijabs out of respect for their religion are they more lonely than people who don't have face masks on? I mean, they have effectively learned to smile through their eyes, um, and it is a culturally accepted look. So this is new for us, all having this mask on. Some are taking it positively, some are taking it nor uh, negatively, but in other cultures, um, not having your face showing is not a 
emotional anything. It is simply a norm. Thank you, all of you, for your input and, and into this discussion around this. Um, there continue to be a, some chat in the chat box and questions coming through, but I do want to go to the case, and maybe we hopefully we'll have some time to get back to this, but um, just to give us a perspective of what people are seeing out in practice. Uh, Amy Calabrese from Coleman Professional Services, are you still on and able to share um, a little bit about what you what you're seeing? Absolutely. Yep. Still on, still willing to share. Um, I was given the opportunity by Emily and Nicole to speak on kind of in general with clients, and it was a very overwhelming and exciting opportunity for me because I know that myself and probably everybody else on the call that works with clients has noticed in the last couple of weeks, there has been an increase of people expressing I'm depressed or I'm sad or I'm feeling lonely. Um, I know personally for me, like in the last couple probably two weeks or so, that conversations with my clients, I have to brace myself for. So when you talk about self-care, you talk about taking care of yourself, I've had a lot of really heavy conversations. Um, and there have been conversations with people that have been very effective in their coping skills in the past, have been solid, have been positive, and then the bright and shininess, that's kind of what I call it, of quarantine sort of wore off, and we don't see an end date. And I think it's really kind of it's hitting people a lot. Um, there were, there was one client I kind of thought about some different people that I could, you know, talk about. And I was thinking what would be the most effective maybe for us as a group. And I think for me, some of my most challenging clients are the ones that live on their own, the ones that are quarantined on their own and who have, have struggled a little bit with depression in the past. Um, I have one client that she kind of fits all those boxes and we talk and she's very open about the fact that she's struggling, which I think is huge. Um, when David was talking about, especially as men, like, you know, oh no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Like, I think across the board people are, oh no, no, I'm good, I'm good, it's fine, I'm, you know, busy, I'm doing stuff. So she's been really good about that. Um, the challenge that I have is I'm on the phone or I'm on video. So I'm unable to kind of sit across from her and kind of get those, you know, readers. And then, you know, she's, she's feeling more depressed and in the conversation, she can recognize it, I can recognize it, but working with her to say, hey, I'm on the phone, why you're on the phone, let's go for a walk. Let's go outside and let's do this. And then you get, mm, it's cold. I don't think I wanna do that. Or you kind of like give some solutions of, hey, you know, what are you thinking about? Um, and when someone is very depressed, that's hard for me personally, because I'm solution oriented. And so it's, hey, what can you do? What are some coping skills that you can have? What's your plan? You know, what can we do? Um, and so that's something that I've personally noticed for me that a lot of my clients are just feeling the weight of it, but we both don't know how to get them out of it. So let me know if you, I guess that's kind of my general spiel. Um, let me know if you have any questions or if you need more information, but I figured I'd kind of start there. Well, thank you very much. I, I, we really appreciate it. And just looking at the chat box, I could see that people in practice are, are hearing and seeing lots of the same kinds of things. Um, so what questions do people have? What more or what feedback do you have? I was kind of curious, what are, what are that specific patient you brought up or patients in general? How are they describing, like, what's sort of happened? Like, you know, the, the novelty of being in quarantine is worn off or whatever. Like, how are, I guess, how are they describing that experience? What kind of flipped recently for them? You know, for some of them, it's not as direct as saying, oh, I don't like what's going on now. And that's kind of an observation. But I think I noticed a lot of people, like, when the stay-at-home order got extended, mm -hmm conversations after that got a lot heavier. Mm -hmm. People were going, oh, there's no end date. Or we would talk about, oh, let's plan our next appointment or let's do this. And everything is kind of up in the air. And so I think that's actually one of those pieces, like people have lost control because one, we don't, we don't really know a lot about the virus. We're still kind of learning as we go. The second part is the only defense we really have is staying at home. And, you know, I think we're all kind of grieving for our normal life. And 
I'm definitely one of them. Um, that's a conversation I have with my clients where I say, hey, we're all in the same water. We might be in different boats, but we're all going through the same thing. This is what I've personally been doing to help cope. These are the things I'm personally doing for myself, which has actually kind of resulted in some really good conversations because people are like, oh, you're struggling with this too? I didn't even think about that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's part of it. I think it's the like getting them to talk about the lack of control in the situation, the fear yeah. that they're having, and kind of, you know, unwrap that a little bit. But that's the thing where it's tough because everybody's doing the same thing. We're all mm -hmm. like, can't control it either. I don't know what's going on. So, yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you. That helps Sorry. a lot. I also just want to say really quick, hold on, um, that uh, I, um, it's fantastic that you're talking about this and you talk about it with your patients. Like, that's really great um, that you acknowledge that this is hard for you too. Um, what a way of like connecting and also that they're opening up to you about what's going on with them in this vulnerable way. So you're doing good work. Thanks. Jody, you have your hand raised. I was going to say, I love that um, the part where it was shared about the introvert and extrovert and how I'm noticing because um, we're doing, we just started the NAMI eight week um, educational program on Zoom and the, the connection and opening up this online Zoom meetings and support groups now, um, the, the attendance is just mind boggling. It's because people who have had such a hard time um, coming out into public, coming into groups because of the gathering and, and the people or whatever, are now joining the support groups because they can be in the privacy of their own home and but also get the help and the support that they, they're connected to the group, but they're in the privacy of their homes. So I, I have the joy of seeing the exact opposite effect happening with those coming out of isolation to the online um, support groups and that we're offering them and doing this eight week pro, um, training where so we're getting ready to do the third week and already seeing people opening up and making that connection. It's been really wonderful. And I promised them that when I was coming to, to, to sit in on this group, that I would send our kudos to Neomed and um, having this dialogue and conversation about the COVID-19 and loneliness, loneliness. So thank you. Thanks, Jody. So there are a couple of questions in the chat that I feel like relate to what you had shared, uh, what everybody is really sharing. Um, I'm going to try to combine one or two, and I invite everybody, you know, including Jody and Amy, to chime in. Um, so Zoom and chat seem very impersonal. So there's a question about how some of you who are making it work more effectively are doing so. And kind of the second part of those questions is, you know, looking at loneliness and, and how it impacts our inner peace and self-esteem, what are some things that we can look for, some cues to look for in our patients? I guess one way in which to make um, like video chat um, and those kind of, you know, Zoom and, and what have you a little bit more personal is by sharing a little bit more deeply, a little bit um, more personal experiences. And I think that, um, you know, just even with like David's um, um, presentation today, just those, those little personalized things that were sprinkled in within the presentation and this kind of sharing, I think that creates that window of like, oh wait, I can relate to that. I, I've been thinking that and, and what have you. And I think the more and more we get to that, rather than just that um, surface level, you know, that mile wide inch deep kind of approach that we do often with uh, uh, social relationships that in some ways it, it could be, uh, you know, try, try going a little bit deeper and sharing those experiences and 
um, personalizing it. You know, I, I'm an introvert and this is how I, you know, relate to it because somebody can tag onto that and know that that experience um, is out there. And so I just think taking it a little bit further beyond that surface level. Um, unfortunately, here's a personal share. We were playing a game on um, online share categories last week and people got to see the competitiveness that, that Jen Dougal has <laughs> in categories. So uh, it was a little something only the family has seen and now it's a little bit more widespread. So those moments are the things that you can see the true nature come out. <laughs> It, the the other thing I would say the a uh, couple observations that I have about this whole impersonality uh, of Zoom, one of the things that I have seen evolve in some spheres at NeoMed is that early on when we were starting to do all these Zoom meetings, every once in a while you would notice someone's little kid uh, like appear in the screen, and and you would see the person trying to shove the kid back out of the picture or a cat would climb up on somebody at the back of someone's chair or a dog that wanted to be uh, attended to. And uh, in, in one particular gathering at Neomed, our, the, the dean actually, the College of Medicine, um, asked people to stop uh, restraining that. Uh, so said, I wanna see your kids, I wanna see your pets, I wanna see that stuff. And, and so in some ways the meetings get a little disrupted when the kids come in or the kids want you know some attention but it also makes it a little bit more personal like uh oh yeah you do have a family or you do have pets or you are living a human life so i think that uh is one way that has kind of mitigated a little bit of that and then the other is i think you know uh, i think we all need to uh, since we're isolated we all need to find ways to not just connect through zoom for work we need to find ways to connect through zoom to do other personal stuff like Jen is talking about playing cards. And in my family, for example, my son, I have, a, I have sons on opposite coasts. One of those sons created a Zoom bridge and so we have dinners together. Uh, we've had, uh, we've played cards together. Uh, you know, we've, we, we, one night we all got in three different cities, we all ordered carry out to arrive at the same time, we sat down and had dinner together but uh, in three different cities. And so to the extent that you can find, and, and the other one I'll mention is that my daughter-in-law organized this huge cooking thing where we were all on Zoom for two and a half hours making lasagna. Uh, and then you know we turned off the Zoom so that we could all eat our own lasagna. But so there's all kinds of ways to, you know, to try to make sure that Zoom becomes a, a way to connect personally as well as professionally. I wanted to get back to, uh something I was talking about with Amy, and it also we had a comment with an, another Amy had about mourning. Um, so I guess like for patients I'm working with, if people recognize the COVID-19 and especially the, the stay at home orders continuing and, and um, if they identified it as being sort of a sense of loss, loss of control or if they perceived it as sort of experience of mourning or both, I then if they or they believe that, then I sort of wonder, about their past experiences of mourning um, and what they found helpful in their past them feel more in control um, and just trying to draw on their own past experiences of overcoming although it's a different situation the experience may be similar so that's one thing I would also think about doing if they perceived it in the way that you're perceiving it I'm going to double back on what Russell was talking about with mourning because um, I myself have had different stages of struggle through this because I'm sure you've seen some of my kids even in within this session. Um, and it is an idea of just that we're going through grief in different stages. So what may feel like it's very sad and very depressed. It's a stage of grief. And how do we get through those other stages and that might help. I have an article. Sorry article here that I'm going to share from the Harvard Business Review and I'm not sure if anybody else has seen that I think it's a pretty good article and um, just trying to reread and refresh on the things that we already know that are a little bit buried just because of what we're going through grief often triggers um, any kind of loss that one's experienced throughout their lifetime and so so here we have a loss of our freedom, a loss of our daily routine, a loss of those things. 
but it also can kind of really reach down into those roots of things that um, those triggering those moments of loss of a of loved one in in their life or or any other forms of loss that exists. So it it really does um, expand and and. You know what I say to to people is you know what you do through those circumstances is really work on that nurturance and that self care um, to navigate that. But as others have been saying, really identify those things that you do have control over, um, and you know really navigating this. And I'm going to give a, an analogy, and so forgive me the technicality of this. And Dr. Zarconi can refrain from making any. Um, funny um, comedic comments regarding this because I know it doesn't work completely. Um, but I usually give this analogy to my, my clients that imagine you were in the bottom of a well and somebody came to the top and said, you know, and you were stuck there. And they said, I have a rope. I'm just not strong enough to pull you out. So they can tie it to a tree and you have to pull yourself out of the well by your own efforts. Okay. So what you could do is tie a knot at the very base of the, the, the rope so you can at least make it to the first knot, right? Um, those knots represent the skills that we have for our self-improvement and our self-care of feeling like we've got some momentum taking steps towards something. Then tie another knot, okay? So I know at this point where the physics might get a little bit arguable on how you can do that. Uh, let's just imagine Bear grill could, Bear grills could do this. Um, but tie a knot at each point that you make success going to the top, and then at the very end, you're going to get to the top, but it's going to take one little piece at a time. And so that's where what David was referencing earlier about self-care, the importance of that, um, identifying what's, what's within your control is so important in that process so that you feel like you can gradually make it one, one little point at a time. Um, kind of to echo off of that where I think knowledge is power like that's one of those personal beliefs that I have and so part of the conversation I've had with people is where are you getting your information is it reliable is it you know can you check the facts on this Facebook doesn't count <laughs> you know, don't tell me that um, but also part of it too is to say okay if we come from a place of knowledge and we come from a place of being reasonable about it when you're in that emotional state you can go back to that logic sometimes. And I've had that conversation even with people in general kind of dealing with depression to say, I get it. When your emotions do not, you know, kind of factor in, I understand that the logic won't help, but it does kind of, where you can kind of grab onto that and grab onto the rope and say, okay, if I do this, this might help. If I go through, you know, my coping skills and the conversations sometimes that I've had with some of my people have been, okay, for the next two weeks, pick three coping skills to try out. Maybe they don't work, that's okay. Maybe we have to change it, that's okay. But in two weeks, we'll figure out, did it help, did it not? Do we add it to the toolbox or do we toss it out and put it in the trash? But I think that's part of it where it's been, you know, let's look for information together. And there's also an element too on the other side to say, I'm not gonna be able to know everything. So I'm not gonna be able to read everything the Wall Street Journal or New York Times has to offer, but, we can look into it and we can try to figure it out together. So I want to jump to a comment. It was a comment and question um, because as I'm reading it and I'm listening to all of the dialogue on you know what to look for in patients and how to go through, help them to manage their coping skills and manage grief. Um, there was a comment from Stacy Shipman. And Stacey, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and share what you shared in the chat box um, about your work with the homeless population. And yeah, I'm here. Okay, yes, yeah, please do share. So I work at a mental health drop-in center. It's a peer-run organization. And normally, um, they can come and go as they want, eight to four. We work with housing. We do a lot of different things. We teach groups. Um, with the shutdown, we can't let them in the building. We're in every day. Um, we are preparing a hot lunch and handing that out through the window, but it's very, it's very hard seeing them every day and not being able to give them the help that they, that they're looking for with everything being closed, all their resources are gone. And I'm really struggling with the depression and the burnout from it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I 
and I wanted to ask you to, to share that because there was also comments following your comments about the frustration of being identified as an essential employee, an essential worker, but not really being able to do all of the things that you would like to be able to do. And this is something that we talked about in our integrated care echo session. Last week, we had a discussion around moral injury, but it's something that I feel like we're going to be seeing a lot of. And while not the topic for today, it just really struck me as something that a lot of you are, are obviously feeling and, and thinking about. So I don't know if the panelists or if anybody has comments or suggestions. I just want to thank you for the work that you're doing. I. Um... I, uh, I don't have any fancy suggestions. That's incredibly challenging. I, I know I worked with people who are homeless for about 20 years and I, and I know it, it's meaningful that you're there, that you're showing up, that you're providing a, their, you know, a meal each day. So yeah, I know that's important, um, but I, I just wanna thank you personally for what you're doing. Um, you are helping the community, you're helping all of us, um, and I really appreciate it. Thank you, Russell. Um and, and Amelia Vassa had also said that she'd like to comment. She works in a hospital environment. So Dr. Zarconi, go ahead. But then, Amelia, feel free to unmute yourself after Zarconi. No, I, I was just going to make the comment. I, I wanted to say exactly the same thing that Russell said, that that uh, I both respect and admire the work you're doing. And, and I'm very grateful that you and people like you are out there. Uh, and and I, the one thing that I uh, remember hearing from Christina Puchowski, who runs the, or at least did, I don't know if she still does, run the uh, spirituality program at George Washington University, used to talk about um, when we are in these moments where, uh, because of conditions that are, uh, or circumstances that are out of our control, we're feeling increasingly inadequate uh, and uh, losing hope that we can um, do good things for others. It's sometimes helpful to reflect on the sense that I am enough, uh, and that might uh, in fact, she talks a lot about reminding herself as she gets ready to see a patient where she doesn't feel like she's able to help the patient as much as she would like to, just to, you know, take a, breath, a cleansing breath, close her eyes, and remind herself, I am enough, by saying that uh, to herself. I, I mean, I think you're obviously, the work that you're doing is more than enough, but uh, I, can't, I can't imagine how hard it must be for you to feel like there's so much more you could be doing. And I think it's it, it's so important to remember, and I, I really appreciate those comments, Joe, because I really think that hits the nail on the head. Um, if the, the importance of of taking care of yourself and recognizing that you have limits to what you can do based on the circumstances that are available, and you know, I I am so appreciative of those who are out on the front lines doing this work, um, and you know, there is a very difficult burden that's there. But it cannot continue if 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 you're not setting boundaries and not taking care of yourself. Um, and I know that sounds near impossible in some circumstances. People don't have those choices um, or feel like they don't. But um, it's so important to recognize that um, that I, like Joe said, uh, you know, I am enough. I can. I'm making the difference. There are days clinically as a therapist where I feel like I use my husband's expression, I'm mailing it in. And I think that was like, oh, okay, I just mailed it in. It wasn't the best day. And then weeks, weeks later, a client will say, hey, that, you know, you know, when you said this, it really made a big impact on me. And I'm like, <laughs> that was the day that I wasn't feeling like I was rocking it. And, you know, I think we have to remember that it's just those small, small measures, we underestimate how those small measures can make a huge difference but also please um, remember to, to, to take care of yourselves. Yeah, just- Amelia, <laughs> you want to give it a shot again? I... Oh, we are unable to hear you. I am sorry. David, go ahead. Oh, I was just piggybacking that the right now, what you're doing by, by uh, framing it like this is you're, you're feeding your loneliness. And I know that it's a half full, half empty thing, but um, you are giving a population that wasn't going to eat a meal and you are, you are feeding them. So 
I, I know that it's not enough. I know that what's happening is, is what we would refer to as structural violence or the, the harm of the infrastructure of society. Um, and that is, that is unfortunately a problem that at the moment is above, I think, all of our pay scales. But um, finding a way to make certain to feed yourself and not food, but emotionally um, is going to be what you need to combat this. So, I mean, I do appreciate what you're doing and I'm, I'm stressed and burned out and I'm not doing that. Additional comments? Um, I know that we were trying to get Amelia and we were having much trouble hearing her audio. Amelia, you are connected. I am persistent. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, Sorry. we can. Thank you. Awesome. I just wanted to share, um, I, I wrote an, an editorial about being a nurse during this time. So I'm, I'm a, a nurse a practitioner, a psych nurse practitioner, but I have a hospital practice too. And to know and understand, sometimes in the community setting, that's what we see is what we're not doing. But the gift we are giving to our overall community and, and mankind as general in general, by abiding by the shelter in place, the minimizing contact, the social distancing, and really looking at how we can restructure our practices so that we can continue to care for people because we'll be well enough to provide care, as well as um, we can continue to not contribute toward the problem. If you look at current cases, we're gaining about four to 500 more COVID cases in the state of Ohio daily, and the death rate is increasing. So not to be an alarmist in any way, but to just say it's real and it's out there and it's an enemy we cannot see that we are fighting. If you worked in a hospital setting, you'd see the vigilance there. Um, we're conserving all of our PPE. Psychiatry is not even allowed in rooms unless there is like a sentinel event happening because masks, gloves, gowns, all of that is so precious. So in a way we are contributing to the battle and the fight. And I think by mirroring the importance of this in our behaviors, and are rapidly adjusting our practices about learning how to be more effective in this new environment, we can effectively communicate that to the clients we work with in an appreciative way as we all combat the awkwardness of this new setting. But I think it's important not to lose sight of the big picture and what we don't know. Very well said, thank you. Follow up from our panelists on. Um... I think that the you know we've talked a lot about what what we can control individually, but there's also some recommendations that are coming out on how hospital systems and medical systems can support their employees um, more effectively. And um, there's a a hub called Clinician Wellbeing Hub on the National Academy of Medicine. Um, that has specifically brought up some recommendations um, to address these concerns. And, you know, a lot of it deals with appropriate communication, appropriate uh, equipment, team building, or opportunities for teams to share um, their experience in really nurturing and developing those environments. So I, I wanted to um, bring that to the attention because I think, you know, there's, there's multiple prongs in this process of, of, of working towards um, taking care of our medical and um, you know all those who are are working in the trenches here to support others. Yeah, I would agree with that, Knight. And I would also want to thank you, Amelia, and your team for what you're doing. And when and and when we hear stories uh, like yours and Stacy's, uh, it, it it I think inspires all of us to to find ways to do more. Um, I, I guess my only other comment, Nicole, that I wanted to make is as I look across the 143 rectangles. Uh, on the on the computer screen, recognizing that you have to page forward to see them all. Um, what what it occurs to me is that it, even in this activity, we um, are a community, uh, and being a community is really important. And this communion 
that we share as part of a community is, in David's terms, I'll, I'll use, uh, is the meal that our loneliness isn't letting us have. And, and so I think to the extent uh, that we uh, continue to seek ways to be uh, in community with others uh, and, uh, and to live in the world, not just uh, with each other, but for each other, um, I think uh, that offers a little hope uh, to mitigate uh, all of our loneliness. So, uh, and I, again, thank all of you organizers for this ongoing gift uh, that we have of uh, ECHO programming. Thank you, Joe, and, and truly no pun intended, but that is, I, I would like to echo everything that you've said because that is one of the beautiful things about doing these Project ECHO sessions, both for the COVID sessions and our regularly scheduled programs, is that it really does create a source of community. And that's been something to have nice that has been built in for a, for a group of us. And I'm glad that we've been able to expand that community to new folks through, some, through hosting these you know, very timely sessions. Other thoughts and, and comments from our panelists? I guess I'm wondering if anyone has noticed any either benefits. I know uh, Jody already mentioned a benefit, but I'm wondering if you all have noticed any personal benefits to going through this experience or if you've noticed any patient benefits of going through this experience. And I'll just say two things really quickly. Um, while I'm more disconnected from my coworkers, I'm way more connected to my kids, um, my 14 year old, my 11 year old. And that has been amazing. Um, and I, 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 you know, it's just, I can't put it into words. Those of you with children know, yeah, it's hard a lot of times, but just to see them learning and to be much more part of their life has been really gratifying. Um, and then secondly, um, working in the substance use field, there are many, we know that those, we believe that those outcomes are getting worse, that many people are relapsing, many people are not seeking recovery. So I'm not, that's for sure true. Um, that being said, though, many patients have um, engaged in meetings they never would have engaged in, in learn meetings because they're virtual and people can literally scan meetings all across the world and find meetings they'd be interested in participating in. And people are learning from that um, and things they would have not done. Um, so again, it's been a lot of hard, but there has been some, some benefits for me. And even some of the so cultural, I oh, I'm sorry. I was just no, saying, no, Amy, go, go, go. Some of the museums are offering free exhibits. Um, I had a friend that I was talking to last week that she said her and her dad, who lives in a different state, they're going to plan a time and they're going to go to the Met. <laughs> and I have another friend that's going to, you know, listen to the opera. And so, I mean, there are some good things that are coming out that are community builders in different ways than maybe we would have thought of before. I wrote this in the text box, but um, I've been living in this house for four years now and I know four of my neighbors. So for the past month, my whole family has been doing a circuit around our neighborhood and introducing ourselves to everybody that we meet. And, and I've actually learned who the people that live in the same neighborhood actually are. And that's odd, but kind of nice. I agree there, you know, as someone said earlier, I'm more disconnected from my coworkers and maybe my local friends, but I am a first generation immigrant and I have reconnected with family from all over the world, thanks to Zoom. It's unfortunate it took a global pandemic for it to happen, but there are cousins I haven't seen physically in 15 years. And now that Zoom is a widely used platform, we're having these very long family meetings where everyone, you know, I've got family in Russia, in China, in South America, and just all over, and we're all on and able to kind of socialize all at the same time. So I'm thankful for that. And then again, I am mourning kind of the, the loss and, and grieving, you know, the friends here locally 
and the family I do have here locally. Thank you for sharing that, Peggy. So as we wrap up, um, a couple housekeeping that if other people would like to share things that they are finding that are positives out of this. Um, I guess my positive is that I do get to spend a lot of time with my dogs, which I mostly enjoy until they start barking during Zoom calls. Um, but I want to remind everyone that we are offering continuing education. So go to eads.com and use today's code 73 zonk um, you can also, you also see in the chat box, there's a link for a Qualtrics evaluation. We love your feedback. We want to know what we could be doing better and how to improve these sessions over time. So please do complete that. And uh, you have uh, the ability to tap into the resources from both this session and from previous sessions, and I imagine upcoming sessions through the library guide that has been built and managed by Simon Robbins, our Neomed reference librarian. Um, so I can put the link back into the chat box for that also, because there's a bunch of COVID specific resources and blogs and recordings, uh, the previous video recordings are available there too. Jamie, Nicole, it looks like you I'm gonna, share something. I was gonna say, I was gonna interrupt you for the chat questions about the CEUs. For EADS, you do need to create an account. It is a free account. Uh, you don't have to put in any information besides your license information. And it'll be an easy way for you to store your CEUs or CMEs for the session. You'll have a certificate available once you're done. Um, if you have any questions about that, feel free to email Neomed Echo, Project Echo at neomed.edu. And Kay or Denise, can you put that in the chat box for me, please? And just please um, put that you're asking about the COVID CEUs. We have a training going on elsewhere today as well. So I have already fielded some questions and I was giving them the wrong code for the wrong training. So I want to make sure you guys have the right codes and are able to get access. And when you set up an account, usually it takes about eight to 10 hours for the approval. It may go back, may go through sooner, but if you by chance miss the 24 hour window, just shoot us an email and we'll make sure you get the credit. Thank you. And, and I'm going to ask that one of our panelists wrap us up for uh, this session because my dogs are starting to bark at my son who's cutting the grass and they could get real, no real noisy real quick. So my big thanks to all of you, but I'm going to hand it over to somebody else to wrap up so that you can actually hear it. I think we should give David the last word. I mean, getting me to shut up is the hard thing. So anytime you want me to talk, you know I'm here. Um, so I, I will plug somebody else's book. Uh, John Cassiopo wrote about 10 years ago a book called Loneliness. And it has been uh, phenomenal for me in learning how to uh, accept my own loneliness. Uh, so as, as a prototypical male, I do have some trouble with, uh, uh, what are those things called, uh, emotions. Um, and, and by acknowledging um, our own emotions, acknowledging what makes us happy, what makes us sad. And it, honestly, from that book, trying to remind us that loneliness is a, um, a thirst has really assisted me both in engaging with my wife and my children as well as the outside world. So um, I, I hate to say that loneliness is a good thing uh, because it is not, but what I can leave you with is the realization that, that loneliness is part of what makes us human and the feeling of loneliness is what propels us to feed with other people for to create our own communities and to build our own campfires so that's my that's my final plug for you david i want to say on behalf of the whole team at neomed thank you for an excellent session and thank you for your engagement with our program i uh, also want to thank all of our panelists and really want to continue to thank our organizing team. We have to continue uh, to do this important work. I'm hoping that, uh, that many of you, if not all of you, are feeling a little less lonely after today's echo. Best wishes and, uh, and stay connected. Thanks everyone, don't forget.